Because your magic, your magic people to me, your magic people to me. Hold your head up high, let your voices fly. I'm proud to be Maori. Karatato, welcome back uh, to Planting Seeds and. Man, it's um, currently quarter to 12, um, and that is almost midnight. <laughs> and here in Nelson, I uh, just finished an awesome uh, kaupapa with Real Talk, and um, me and the sister Nix, I've uh, been talking about, you know, doing a podcast, and we've done one during the lockdown period, and it was just awesome just to sort of like connect in that space. But uh, we're now here in person, uh, and it's just good to connect with you, sis. So welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, bro. A lot has happened, eh? Yeah, yeah. How to help? It seems it seems as though like you're in a space now where um you're you're done sort of talking about your your full story. Um, I wouldn't say full story, mm. but like the parts that you've just been repeating over and over again. I mean, sometimes I I don't mind going back into my psychological library to to bring it out when it needs to be brought out. Um, but there's just so much more to me than my trauma and um, I think I'm moving into a space where I want to really kind of focus on the comeback as opposed to the setback, Mm -hmm. you know, so and and just really kind of motivate and encourage others to focus on the the, uh, positive things. be forward focused at all times, you know, and things like that. Focus on all the good things that are going on and your dreams and things like that, your goals. But, you know, in saying that, my story, there there are parts that are very important and they can and encourage people <clears throat> and motivate people. And I don't mind going there, Um when I need to, mm. you know, but not for every go, Papa. And real talk especially is, well, there was no rules. It's real talk. And um, for me, I'd rather focus my uh, time on the stage, especially because it's rangatahi that are in the audience, majority. Um, I'd rather pump into them life lessons and tools for their tool belts because they're about to embark on a big journey and <clears throat> they need to know what the real world looks like but they also need to be equipped with some tools and instead of me telling them about the journey I've been on how about I I use some of the lessons I learned on my journey and, and pass them over to the rangatahi for their journey. And and that's what I've been focused on. And I can sense it and there is definitely like a shift in that. Mm. And I feel for sure there's you've you've spent a lot of time in that space, eh? And and you've extracted a lot of things from that that's helped inform some of the good things that have been sort of like coming into your life since all of the things have happened. And I think about that time when we did have that catch up and mm. we did talk and man, it was powerful for that time that we were in, eh? Like we we're all in the space of of uncertainty of, of what was, was going so trippy, on, eh? bro. Whoa. There was like a such a crazy time for that particular corridor. Yeah, you know what I mean. And for it to have the impact that it did, mm. um, I feel it just sort of like speaks to how much was in that for that particular time. Yeah, mm. yeah, for sure. But you know, just touching on that COVID time, just this is going way off track. Yeah, but man, how out of it that that happened in our lifetime (laughs) straight up you know like we weren't we weren't around when the war when the wars and things like that but this was a pretty i mean that's definitely going to go down in history and it happened in our lifetime that's i always trip out about that i I do too it's sort of Mm. like a global pandemic and there was there was a lot of, I feel, um, challenges within that, but I, I enjoyed it, eh? Like, mm. even after the fact, and this is no disrespect to people who, who did struggle during that period, yeah. but for me, I sort of saw it as there was, like, a forced awakening happening, you know, where everyone did have to sit with themselves yes. and, 
and deal with it. And, and a lot of people were able to do it in a healthy way, but then a lot of people were very vulnerable in mm. that sort of like space. So it's interesting that we are alive in that point in time eh, and going it. through that. Like, oh, so I, you know, far out, I, I, I've never done so much walking in my life. <laughs> That I did in um, Ben and I was looking good. I was looking good. Now, you know, and because of my license, um, I didn't want to be vulnerable on the roads. Uh, so I was really walking that extra mile. <laughs> and now, you know, now I've got the cover of other cars. No. <laughs> I'm driving everywhere. Oh, my God. Mm. And then I look in the mirror and I'm like, God, go for a walk, girl. And I'm like, go away. I can drive. <laughs> <laughs> I can drive now. <laughs> It is an interesting time, actually, Mm. like, as we sort of and reflect on how that was. And, bro, that was only, like, last year, you know. Like, it feels like such a long time ago. But but I think it was awesome because it gave people an opportunity to, like you said, sit with themselves, but also explore their creativity and things like that. Maybe they were interested in art, but because of responsibilities and things like that, we become distracted in mahi to pay bills. And so we forget these little hobbies and things that used to um, nurture our mental health and things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it was cool in that time to kind of rediscover that part of of yourself, you know? Well, you didn't have a choice, really. Well, you didn't. Um, And there was also a time for me to really flex my acting. (laughs) Bro, that was like a real pivotal time, man. (laughs) That was a pivotal time, man. You were bringing it out. I think I was putting out out skits like every day. (laughs) (laughs) Bro, that was because you had just got those wigs too, eh? Yeah. And like they just came at the exact time. Like right time where you yeah. had multiple personalities oh just coming God. out. I'd, I'd go for a walk, put my mask on, go for a walk around the lake, and then I'd find myself running home because I had conjured up the skit. Yeah. And I'd run home and run into my bucket, grab me out the wig, and oh hell, yeah, it was crazy. But hey, man, it kept me busy. So yeah, and talk about what's happened since then, you know, and. I feel a lot has happened yeah. and like talk about that transition from, from moving out of lockdown into, you know, doing some of the beautiful mahi that you're doing now as we move more into that positive mm. sort of like frame of mind and, and what's been governing that. I think the biggest transition that's happened since then was the fact that I got my children full time. Um, yeah, because I mean, in the last three years that I've been on this journey, my ultimate goal was just to be present in their life. It wasn't even, um, uh, what do you call it? In my mind, it wasn't even a possibility of me having them full time because I just thought I had fucked it up um, to the point, yeah, that there was no return. I mean, I, I kind of knew that if I worked my ass off, I'd get to see them you know, every weekend, but I did not fucking think that it was a possibility that I could have them full time. So when that came about, it was a massive shock. Um, Not only that, I had up until that point, uh, I was really doing things like if a kaupapa came up down the other end of the island, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. You know, and I was I was in this thing of because I had no responsibilities really, right. you know, because I, I didn't have them in my care. So I had gotten myself into, yep, I'm I'm gonna get in my car, I'm gonna go for a drive, I'm gonna go here. And then you know, when I got my children it was like Okay, well I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. And then, you know, and, and that's what I worked for, you know, to have my children and things like that. But it was also a really out of it transition for me because it was like uh, I went from fucking getting in my car and fucking off to one end of the island to the other end within twenty four hours to oh you ain't going nowhere, Chief. Well wow. these kids gotta go to school every day, you know, and, and um I don't know if I was kind of struggling with it, but it, it was just a really strange kind of thing mm. because it was a, 
it was really like an overnight thing that I, I, you know, jumped into the space and things right. like that. Best thing ever to happen in my fucking life, don't get me wrong, but I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, no, it was easy, breezy, mm. you know, transition. It was a really kind of out of it um Type period, not only for me but for my children. For your children as well, because fucking now we had been separated for all that time, and and um, now they've got to come back and live with this mum, and um, yeah, and get to know who she is and what are her rules. Does she have rules? And, yeah. And on the flip side, I was like, fuck, do I have rules? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. And I'm I'm meeting this, you know, 10 and 11-year-old, and like I was saying earlier tonight, who already have beliefs, a belief system and things like that. So I'm trying to fucking work around my kids to see, holy shit, where do I fit in here? So mm. it was just... Really out of it um, thing. A lot of highs, a lot of lows, you know. my I, I was having a bit of issues with my son where one minute he'd rebel and, you know, be quite naughty. And the next minute he was showing signs of separation anxiety. And, right. Um, like if I wasn't, if I had to go somewhere every two minutes, mum, where are you? Or mm. where were you? Who were you with? You know, and I was like, holy fucking hell, you sound like a toxic partner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so it was just, a, it's just been an out of it journey for me and the kids, yeah. But, I mean, now it's been a while now and um, they've totally settled in. We've got routines, we've got structures. Fuck, I've we even, you know, created traditions in our family within this. I mean, they, they only came into my care this year. And within that time, we have um, Wednesday is when they buy their lunches, yeah. you know, and Thursday is takeaway Thursday yeah. in our household. And we're incorporating um, a quiz night for the kids, <laughs> you know, cool. once a week. And fuck, they love it, man. Like, it'll be Tuesday and and they'll be saying, Mum, we're wait. buying our lunch tomorrow. Yeah. It's, it's buy our lunch Wednesday, you know, or... It'll be Wednesday or Thursday morning. Mum, what are we having for Takeaway Thursday? So we've already successfully imprinted these traditions into their their heads. Mm. And, um, yeah, so that's pretty fucking cool that's for the mean. short amount of time, you know. Um, I did actually contact because with that separation anxiety, I was really starting to freak out like, fuck. And and then also I was feeling guilty because I was like, I fucking did that to them. Right. You know, because I up and left and went off on my tangent for all those years. And so I was going through that thing of, what the fuck have you done, Nicole? Right. You've done this to these kids, you know? Well, to my son, my daughter, she couldn't give a fuck where I was. <laughs> oh, she's, she's hearty. Is she hearty, oh, eh? She's hearty she loves her TikToks from what oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> she's got the skits going on. She does. Um, but it was my boy, like, so I wanted to try to get her um, to the bottom of it, and I was really lucky. Dr. Henny Moore Alda reached out Beautiful. to me. Yeah. And um, she said, hey, babe, you know, um, you can contact Hold and uh, Waikato and just have a yarn to them. They can provide you with the tools that you need. Mm. And so I did um, contact them. And when I spoke to them, they said, hey, man, you've just got to remember this. After everything you and them have been through, it's not going to be an overnight mm. thing. You know, um, I reckon, and this is what they said, I reckon just... Let things unfold for a little while. They've only just come into your care. There's going to be a bit of a transition period. Let things unfold. We'll keep your case here for your son. And if you get down the track and, and things start to progress in that, then we're right here. Mm. And we can open that, reopen that case and you fellas can come in and things like that. But but our suggestion, Nix, is just let Need things it. unfold, you know, get to know each other and things like that. Um, and that was awesome advice. Mm. because That's awesome, mate, eh, from a service. Yeah, yep. I, d- I didn't want him to be labelled mm. with anything. Right. But I, at that time, when he was showing signs of, like, really fucking 
just really stuck to my ass. I can't think of another way to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started panicking, you know, because, yeah, I I just wanted to, I think I was going through that thing, like I said, of feeling guilty because I, I thought that I had done this, so I needed to be the one to right. fucking get the help for this, you know. But I didn't take into consideration that, yeah, man, we have been apart for years. Mm. And so, obviously, there is going to be a bit of a teething period, yeah. eh? Mm. And he's probably always just <clears throat> desired you to be around. And yeah. then finally having you around, just you leaving might have just yes. sort of given them that sense, like, fuck, is she going to go again? Yeah. You know, so it's good that you're able to get that advice and now sort of like nurturing yeah. that relationship with mm. your kids again. And did, you, did they, was there ever open dialogue around it with your kids around like, hey, you're going to come with mum? And like, how was, how did that all like go down? It started with my daughter first um, because I spoke to their dad and um, I brought up the idea, you know, maybe. Um, maybe I have that girl for maybe six months. And, mm. you know, like I said, I didn't think it was a possibility, but I yeah. thought, you know what, what do I have to lose? Yeah. Who's either going to say yes or no? And my, I, ha- I kind of practiced my speech <laughs> You're good before at that. I delivered it. <laughs> um, but I, I thought, well, she's 10 and she's going to be getting her period and things like mm. that. And I can be there to help her with stuff like that. And he agreed. And I was like, holy fuck, what the fuck? Um, So that was awesome. And then, yeah, I think she was with me for about a month, eh? Sorry if I know I'm asking my mate for confirmation. A week? eh? Weeks. Weeks. So she was with me for a couple of weeks. And then I just thought, fuck it, I'm going to try my luck. And so I rang him again and I said, hey, um, what about me having that boy as well? Um, and, you know, I thought he was going to say, fuck, mate, you're dreaming. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, but the reason that I was thinking about Jordan as well is because when my daughter came to live with me, I created her own bedroom, mm. her own space. I wanted my my daughter to have, you know, she's becoming a teenager. I want her to have her own space, learn how to look after her space and, um, yeah, and all those types of things. So I made her up a room, but then Geordie would come for the weekends and I kind of felt as though he would come in and look at everything that and, she's and, got. Yeah, yeah, and then he was feeling kind of like he was missing out. Mm. Um, and it was making me feel like shit, so I just thought, oh, fuck it, I'll ask her, you know, their father. And um, he said, oh, I'll think about it. And I said, my kōrero to him was, you know, you did an awesome job when I was off on my fucking shit trying to find myself and things like that. And when our son died, you know, he didn't get a chance to grieve mm. because he because could. I took off. And so he just had to kind of bottle that up and get on with it and raise our kids. And he did fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. But my thing was, you know, I'm back now and I can, you know, I can look, I can have them and you can go and do you for a bit. Not forever, mm-hmm. but have a bit of you time, you know, because he's still going through it. You can tell it's, it's, um, you can tell it's in there you know, inside Mm. him. Um, But he's just kind of never had the opportunity to work through it because he's had to stay strong because I was absent. Um, And so I left that with him. I put that on on the table for him and I left it with him and a couple of, I think it was the next day, he said, all right then, let's give this a go. And I was like, oh. <laughs> what the fuck? Everything that you've worked so yeah. hard for, and I really love the story because I've been observing it big time. Eh? So it's like there's a lot of people that I've been sort of like following and mm. who I've been inspired by, and who I feel like I'm connected to. Man, beautiful things are happening in their life where they've stayed so true to what they've believed in from mm. the start. 
you know, and there's a lot of good things happening and everything that they've wanted is like right there in front yeah. of them and it's coming in. And man, I do like, really feel like I want to give a massive shout out to their father yeah, and, sure. you know, for him to be able to do all that beautiful mahi and mm-hmm. even just the strength that he's um, had to support you um, in, in coming back into their life because I could almost imagine so much resentment that other Tani would have had um, yeah. If it was anyone else. Well, he saw me yeah. at my worst, you mm. know. Before he um, brought the kids home, he had tried to salvage me. Mm. And I just, I was nowhere near ready. Yeah. And so he saw the person that I had become. Mm. And I feel as though, you know, he picked up the kids. He tried to save our marriage. And he just saw, you know, when he saw me, fuck, there's no way that's happening. She's mm. gone. Mm. And so, you know, he'd have been like, well, I'm going to get these kids out of here because, fuck, I don't want them to, they don't know that lady. I don't even fucking know her. Right. And But then to come home and, and to struggle and and to have some kind of thing of, you know, she should fucking be here. Mm. She should fucking be here helping me, you know, and things like that. But the thing is, he never fucking put me down to those Far. kids. He always told them that mum's sick mm. and that's why she's gone because she's sick and she's trying to get help. You know, he Far. didn't, um, like, alienate me, yeah. his appearance. Which I'm just like, I already know there's an abundance of people mm. that being put in that situation, they would have really pumped into those kids' heads. She's gone. She's yeah. never coming back here. Never mm. going to see her. She doesn't give a fuck about you. All that type of thing. But he never did that. He just told them, I'm sick and she's going to come back. Wow. Uh. You know? What an awesome man, and yeah. again, just a big mahi out to him, and honestly, even out to your children as well mm. for um, just the space that you've been able to provide for them, and um, you and your and your father and Huntley, and just like what you guys have been able to create mm. and the journey that you've freaking been on, sis, it's incredible. And you know, some of you caught it all tonight, and I'm sure there's been so many people who have doubted, like. Everything that you now have in your life, everyone's mm. doubted like, nah, it's never going to happen. Like, you don't deserve those kids. All of that yeah. bullshit, you know. And a big part of your corridor tonight was around, you know, just people and their judgment, people and their opinions. And so, you know, do you just want to, like, voice, you know, some of the things that that come up for you when you think about that? When I think about what people have Like, said people and their opinions and, and oh. just how a lot of people... Um, are victims to that. Yeah. No? Uh, I've, I've met so many people in my last three years, um, which is a given, you know, my whole life's public, and I meet people that have been through so many situations and things like that. And plus I also have people that message me daily. Mm. And a lot of the messages in that that I have received or the feedback that I've received is... People love um, my confidence and things like that. They wish that they had that, um, but it's like they, they're they afraid. Mm-hmm. So something I try to really pump out there tonight at Real Talk was that when you stop giving a fuck about uh, how other people view you, how, you know, what they think about the way you look, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you think, the way you act. When you stop giving a fuck about their opinions, not only do you take back your power, but you really fucking step into the space of being unfuckwithable <laughs> and being living a life of being unapologetic because you should be fucking unapologetic yep. for living your life how you how choose. you want to um and i really wanted to pump that out to rangatahi because I don't want to get too deep into it, but I mean, it comes back to the the rates of suicide, the Mm. statistics and things like that. When you think about 
um, a lot of the stats, it's it's our rangatahi and things like that. And I think as adults, there's, there's a quote that says, if you have the ability to make change, you have the responsibility to make change. It's an obligation. We know we have walked that walk. We have years of experience, years of knowledge, years of wisdom, and we need to really fucking pump that into them. Mm-hmm. And a, a massive one that I wish I had, a, you know, it had been pumped into me when I was fucking way back then, was stop giving a fuck about anybody else. Mm. The only people you should be caring about, you know, in terms of their opinions are those that fucking love you to death. Yeah. Because when you're sad, when you're going through anxiety and you're, you you know, you might be having a bout of depression, who the fuck is going to rub your back? Yeah. Is it those people that were calling you ugly or saying that you're useless or you're a fucking failure? Are they going to be there to rub your back and say, Oi, you got this. Mm. You know, you're going to be all good. Straight up, I'm going to be sitting right here. Nah, it ain't them. It's your fucking no. It's your partners. It's your, you know, your children. It's all of, all of those people. So, you know, when I say don't give a fuck, um, I mean... Give your energy to those that truly deserve it. My mate over here, she she shared something uh, a while ago, and it's it's never left left me. And it was prioritize your energy. Hundred. Give that energy to those that will give it back in a fucking mm-hmm. heartbeat. I just feel as though a lot of people are not living their best lives because they're not prioritizing their energy properly. Exactly. If they just focused on all of those people that make them feel good, make them feel warm and happy inside, they'd fucking be living their best life. And those people that make them feel warm, happy, they do that because they want to see you, 100% you. They don't want to see you try and act like somebody else. Mm -hmm. They don't want to see you fucking doing things that aren't you. They want all the only expectation that they have of you is to be your fucking self. Self, yeah. And those are the people that you want in your life. Those are the people that I have in my life. Um, they we don't have time for fucking negative shit. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, there's the odd time we might pull each other up and say, yeah. "Bro, you you fucked up," you know, yeah. but. You know where I, that's coming yeah, from, eh? We've, you know, like we talked about earlier today, when you have your close friends and things like that, you fellas have put in the mahi on that relationship, like me and my mate here. We've put in so much mahi, we've been around each other, we've lifted each other up, you know, when, when we fell down. So, you know, she has permission. Yeah. To fucking pull me up where anyone else try, I'll be like, uh, who the fuck are you? (laughs) What the fuck are you up to? You don't know me like that. Yeah. You know, and, um, and so I'm surrounded with people like that, you know, and, and, and that's what I encourage fucking everyone. I'm not Mm -hmm. just going to say rangatahi because there's a lot of adults that, that, do it as well, hundred percent. Well, for sure, you know. And um, something I did say tonight: I would rather five people around me who are honest, raw, truthful to me, loyal, as opposed to five hundred people mm. that'll stab me in the fucking back as soon as I turn around. Yeah, you know. And um, and and that's something that you know we just need to really be thinking. The minute you focus only on yourself and only on your priorities, only on your children, on your partners, only on those that you fucking love, man, your whole world's gonna change. Life's just better. Yeah. You know, life is just so much better. And what I like to think about when it comes to those sort of things, it's like such a disease, you know. And I talk about this yeah. shit a lot. Like it's a crippler. It you submit to these, um, because the thing that I think about often is you know you see a cut 
Mm. Right? You you see a sprained ankle. You feel that effect. But when you're thinking about judgment and opinions, mm. those also have an effect. Even though you can't see it physically, yeah. there's something happening like subconsciously that's making you sort of like how you're saying tonight, not cut your hair or mm. um, make you not wear that because of what someone has said to you in the past. And I think furthermore to that, which makes it even more sort of like heavy is that it moves into sort of like assumptions. Like because someone said something when you're like 10, Mm. that's carried on with you to like the age of 20 and you're only creating things in your mind that hasn't even happened. Yeah. You know, you don't, you're still not wearing that jacket because of what happened at the age of 10. Because you're living in fear. Living in that fear, you know. And I think that's the crazy thing about our minds. It's mm. we, we create all of these different scenarios. And it's sort of like Jane, like, fuck, who lives down the road is going to, like, think I look ugly. So I'm mm. not going to wear that. And that's not even true. Like, you know, it's not until you get those direct messages that you have to put up those guards and it's not like you retreating. It's like, nah, you standing your ground and Mm. recognizing those boundaries. And I feel it's just important, like the way you share the message, because it's such a thing that has been sort of shown or thrown around, like who gives a fuck what people think? Yeah. You know, and it's not as easy as that sometimes. It's like um, when I say... Who gives a fuck? Oh, you know, you shouldn't give a fuck. Mm. What I mean to say is you should give a fuck about some things. Yeah. About things that you're going to get a positive return on. You know, Mm. if you're going to give any fucks, (laughs) then fucking give a fuck about that, you know, because you're going to get a positive return. Don't give a fuck about – it brings me to that quote – you could lay down so they can walk all over you. Mm. They're still going to complain that you weren't flat enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? So You're never going to please people. Yeah, exactly, like, You're man. never, ever going to meet people's like expectations, expectations but the of thing how is, you should be. The thing is, those that love you through and through, they don't have the expectations. Because mm-hmm. they see and allow you to be. And I feel even... Even when, say, like, Nick's, I expect you to be this way. And if you were to ever meet that expectation, you're miserable. Mm. You're going to be so unhappy trying to meet my expectation. And I think that's what people need to recognize as well. I was nearly going to say, oh, that's nice. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that's what people aren't necessarily um, taking into consideration Mm. is we're sacrificing our own happiness Happiness, to please other people. And that's where it's sort of like you got to not give a fuck about that yeah. and just focus on the happy. Because at the end of the day, we can only control how we engage in things, how we yeah. think about ourselves, how we interpret what other people might be thinking. Mm. But if we can shut out that and just focus on how we see ourselves. Well, I mean, it's not our responsibility to make anyone fucking happy <laughs> except ourselves. Ourselves. Hundred. No, sh- that, that's and, our fucking responsibility. Yeah. From the minute we wake up to, the, sorry, to the minute that we go to sleep, that's our responsibility. Mm. If this person's, you know, wants you to do this to make them happy, fuck them. Mm. Hey, that's on them to make themselves happy. Yeah, I would even say that, um, you know, there's the analogy of like, make sure your cup is full. Mm. I would give when the cup is overflowing. When I have something to give. You know, that is when I sort of like go out and I'll give service or I'll sort of like go and help someone. But man, if my cup is like half full or if mm. it's sort of drained, man, I'm like, I'm very aware and I prioritize my energy yeah. where I drop into meditation or I do the things that make me feel good. And, you know, a lot of people, again, I mean, it's just, you know, we don't want people to fucking have that fear doing it's like we've been liberated of it and i Mm. mentioned to you tonight like i have moments of it and it's only when i feel fearful of trying something new going into the uncomfortable and that's when i get into that space of like oh like do i deserve it or am i worthy of it or is this person gonna say that there's hints of that for Mm. sure still in what i do but i just have the mechanisms right i have the tools to not let me sort of just suffer in that space yeah. for a period of time. It's just a moment and then well, I get see, out of it. If the opportunity has landed on your fucking lap, it landed there for a reason. 
Lovely. Otherwise, it would have went over here and landed on this person's lap. And the thing that we need to remember is putting yourself first is not fucking selfish. Mm. Society has this um, perception that when you put yourself first, you're being fucking selfish. You should be thinking about others <laughs> all the fucking time. Um I don't agree with that because <laughs> if if um if you ain't all good, how the fuck are you gonna be of service or help anyone else? You know, so to put yourself first is fucking self love. Yeah. Not fucking selfish. And for all of those that um project or judge you because of that what was the, the the quote the key quote of tonight? Those that are hurt hurt others. Mm. Hey, and those are the ones that will project that onto other people. That's not my fucking issue. Yeah. You know, that's not my problem. What other people think of me is none of my fucking business. <laughs> you know, if I have self love enough to say, you know what? I'm I'm not uh, oh, what, what's a good fucking a good example for this? Oh, okay. So y- you meet someone, you get a bad vibe. Mm. I've had this very, very recently. Mm. Um, I met someone, I had a bad vibe, and straight away I said said to myself, I have a court it all with myself, and I said, you know what? We're going to hold off from um, giving this per- person the privilege of any more of your energy, Nix, mm. because... You need to prioritise your energy, and um, I was already picking up real bad vibes, and I'm pretty on like that. I Mm. don't get it all the time, but (laughs) fuck, when I get it, I get it real hearty, Mm. and I have to say to myself, I love me enough to reserve my energy for someone I know done fucking well I have a connection with. Love that. I'm not going to just use up energy in my tank when when I already can tell a mile away. And you know how I've been able to pick that up, really? Because I've been through fucked up shit with toxic <laughs> yeah. people. Mm. And instead of repeating and repeating and not keeping my eyes open for the, the red flags, I fucking, my eyes are peeled back. Mm. And so now I can see it a mile away. And that that's the type of corridor I have with myself is, nah, man, Nicola, I love you too much. To let you go and spill the last dribs of your fucking gas, of your fuel, energy, um, on this, on this, mm. when I already can feel like I'm not going to because you're positive just going to get return. drained. Eh? Yeah, I'm not. Gonna you're get either going to get return. drained, and it's not going to be mutually beneficial. Nah. And and those are the exchanges that I like, and that's why I've, like I've had the best day today. Like I traveled down with the sister Panya and. Mm. You know, we were just like jamming the whole time, just mm-hmm. yarning and, you know, being around you, being in that environment of real talk. It's all these are beautiful engagements, man. It's just like energy exchanging. Yeah. And it's in that right vibration. Like everyone is in that same sort of like good vibe. And mm. that's why I just feel energized. And that's why it's like, you know, past midnight and we're still going hard. You know yeah, what I mean? Out. And, you know, where I want to move into, sis, so and I, I had this thought, um, that I was going to sort of mention in my corridor, but I didn't. I just forgot about it because I was just on my own on little your buzz. Vibe, <laughs> my the meditation. <laughs> that was me. yeah. But I want to ask you what your idea of love was, you know, growing up, and has it changed? Mm. You don't call me on the spot here. <laughs> um, my idea of love... To be honest, I don't think I even fucking had one. I I think that for so many years, love was just the binding of mm. two people. To say I love you was just the words to commit, to say this is me and you. Right. No fucking around because I've told you that I love you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And to me, I feel as though to say I love you, um, that was a part of the response, like a responsibility. There was no, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to say I don't feel as though I was showing it mm-hmm. or because um, 
I went through intergenerational abuse. You know, I had a out of it, really out of it, um, childhood and things like that because, and and we're dealing with this now. But my mum, she wasn't given tools, the right, right tools, and so when she had me, she was kind of trying to build a house with a fucking toothpick. Mm, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and that that my childhood, I spent the majority of the time f- trying to figure out why my mum was being like this to me, mm. you know. And I, I spent a lot of time looking at my, my mates and their mums, and their mums were <clears throat> they were way different to mine. Mm. They were had a really good relationship with their daughters. Um, their daughters could chit chat with them, and I remember sitting there like, "Fuck." This fucking out of it. I don't mm. know if yous are fucked up, yeah, or if, if I'm fucked up, mm. and, and the dynamics of my home are fucked up, and and I think I just chose to think that they were fucked up <laughs> <laughs> because because to me, shit, this was normal, yeah, and and then for me to go in the home and. All the way down to, um, you know, oh, I'm going to make, come, come next, let's go make us a feed. And I'm like, what the fuck are you allowed to just make you a sandwich? Yeah, you know, right true. down to those types of things. Um, or or we'd be in the room and the mum would come in and lie on the bed. What are you girls up to? And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Uh, you know, because I, because my mum never had that. Mm. I reckon if my mum had have went to her friends when she was younger and saw that, she would have been like, what the fuck is this too, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and so my mum never had that that kind of connection with her her mum, and so she didn't know how to have that with me. With and plus she was still fucking trying to figure out, you know, what the fuck happened in my life, mm. you know, where I didn't know that. I'm only just learning this about my mum. Wow. Like, and I'm talking like in the last two weeks. Beautiful. <clears throat> but for so many years, especially my childhood, um, I just was filled with a lot of fucking questions. Um, I can't understand why I'm being treated like this. i got two younger brothers and they had this connection with my mum mm. both of my brothers and I became very fucking jealous of like what the fuck what the fuck have I done mm. you know but mum she didn't know how to connect with her daughter because her mother didn't know how to connect Equal with her, her and her mother didn't know how to co- it was just a fucking trickle yeah. all the way down and in the last two weeks you know I've had a all with my mum and she was like babe you know just fucking in amongst our combo she goes fuck you have no idea how proud I am of you and, and, but, you know, and I'm like oh wait and she's big, like eh? um, you fucking broke the chain you know I'll see you with your daughter you know and it's it's not until those moments that I'm like holy fucking hell true that you know because um, the way that I grew up because my mum was filled with so much insecurities and she was just dealing with so much fucking shit and she didn't know how to fucking, you know, how to deal with it and stuff mm. like that. Um, what the fuck was I talking about? Stop that there. What was I saying? Just about how she was proud of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hang on. I'll, I'll tell you something. Um, I don't know if you even want to cut that because what I'm going to say now is pretty trippy. No. Carry so on. I remember uh, when I got off the drugs and I started seeing a counsellor and when I would start talking about really heavy kind of things, traumatic experiences or just really heavy things, immediately my mind would fucking go blank. And I remember like, and then I'd come to is, and I'd kind of be like, fuck, did I just fall asleep? But... Um, and... And then I'd straight away be like, what was I talking about? Like, immediately. Mm. And I remember the counsellor saying to me, um, you know what, that's really, really normal for someone that's been through some traumatic shit or someone that's... um, What happens is you go digging around in that psychological library and you start flipping through the pages of some really hearty kōrero or um, that have 
hearty emotions attached mm. to it and your mind goes on fucking overload and it doesn't know how to process everything and it shuts down. Wow. <laughs> And and it, your your mind just shuts down. There's too much emotions. There's too much thoughts. There's too much fucking thing, and you shut down. And it shut down for a brief, you know, couple of seconds, and then you come back and you have no fucking idea what you were talking about. Holy <laughs> hell! Is that where that just went to I just think then? So, Holy! Man, I think so because. Um because I think all of this is new with your mum too, eh? Yeah, it is. Like it's all new, and like it's just recent. with my mum trying to figure herself out, mm. I mean, like, I can't even tell you, I'm 34, and that's, I've had questions about why, you know, how the fuck did we get like this? How come I don't mm. ever fucking bond with you? How come you didn't try? How come I'm like this with my fucking daughter? How come you weren't like that with me? Mm. You know, all the way up until... Just very recently. Well. But, you know, no resentment. Mm. I have not. That's what I was saying before. Um, about her having connection with my brothers and that. Yeah. Because she was so insecure and things like that. I feel like a majority of my childhood, I grew up uh, as if I was the other woman. Right. You know what I wow. mean? Wow. Um, you know how if a oh, fuck if a man uh, you know things with another woman, mm. there's a girlfriend on the side, right? And the anger and the resentment that yeah. you would have for this for fucking that, girlfriend on yeah. the side, well, that's kind of how I feel like I grew wow. up, and I get it. You know, my mum, she was never showing love or anything like that. Um, she had really abusive fucking childhood. She was adopted, and she had a really abusive childhood and um, psychologically abusive, physically abusive, and shit like that. She didn't know what the fuck love was because mm. she was never given it. She was adopted two days after her birth, and and that was to a family that couldn't have children, but then one year later they got pregnant. Wow. And so... This was the miracle child. Yeah. Fuck the other child. Mm. And so for my mum's whole life, she was they in never let her forget she was the adopted one and he was the fucking real one. So for her whole life, she was trying to find love, you know, and, uh, and then she met my dad and he fucking... She was like the apple of his eye, <laughs> and she he put her up on this pedestal, and and she was like, "Holy fuck, what is this? You know, fuck, this feeling's amazing." And then she got pregnant with me, and then his attention and his love was obviously split with his his daughter. wife and yeah. his first child wow. and daughter. And, and um, you know, my mum trying to fucking process everything and, you know, and then she, the love that she was getting all that attention is now split in half after she spent so many years trying to fucking trying to find it, mm. you know. She, there was a thing where she looked at me out of it, you mm. know, and that's how I was brought up. And... um you know, fuck, it's not until I sit down with my mum and, and she tells me this. It's a, it is a lot to process because because of all the years that I fucking, how, you know, had shit going on inside me and to get the answers and that. But I feel for my mum, man. Me. Fuck, you know, I feel for my mum. I feel wretched for her because not only did was did I have questions? She had fucking questions too. Yeah. You know, but I never took that into consideration. You know, so not only was she trying to be a good mum, the best fucking way she knew how, mm. but she was also questioning why the fuck her mum wasn't a good mum. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I feel wretched for that because... I don't even think about what the fuck she must have mm. been going through. And that was, comes from that sort of sense of your your hurt and your needing. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that and I feel that sort of you you just didn't have the awareness to even um to know, you know, what was yeah. mum was going through because in in your mind it's like mum needs to be this for me. 
Yeah. You know? yes. And it's not until you get older that you actually start to recognize like, hey, mum has got a past yeah. too yeah. or dad's got a past too. I and don't think she really even would kind of talk about it because she was really still trying to process mm-hmm. it. You know, all these what's normal, what's abnormal. Maybe fucking the way I was brought up was normal, mm. you know? So I don't think she really kind of talked about it. That might be why I didn't really even stop to think what the fuck she must be going through. Right. You know, but just going back to an hour ago when you asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> we got there. Yeah, we got there in the end. Um, what is my thing of love or what was it? Mm. Well, it was fucked up, mm. and and that's okay because, you know, I got the tools that my mum gave me, mm. and she didn't really have much to fucking work from, right? You know, so, so love was, it wasn't really, you know, love. It was responsibility, mm. you know. Um, fuck. And in terms of getting a partner, yeah, if I say I love you, then you're mine Mm. and I'm yours. Yeah. You know, and we're stuck together. And that was pretty much it. There was no fucking, oh, my heart throbs, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God, sleepless nights. You know, there was none of this. It wasn't that. It wasn't like a fairy tale kind of. No, man, because I think... I didn't really feel love from my mum because I don't, I don't think she really knew how to give it. Mm. But she stood hearty as her role as a mother yeah. because of responsibility. Yeah, you know. Um, I also feel there's sort of like a. Um, I feel like she loves she loves you obviously. Yeah. And I'm sure there was so much in her that wanted to love you more, but just didn't know she didn't as know, well. Man. She, she didn't, didn't know. know like what their feeling was. Yeah. And I feel as children, we receive love from our parents mm. in, in the way that they try to show it. But as children, we know what we need. And it's about, um, you know, me becoming a father. Um, the thing that I'm very aware of, and things can, are always going to change, but mm. my current um, thoughts on that is is like how do I communicate you know with my child and you know me and Hinepanya we can you know try and be the best parents but how do we know we're actually good parents mm. you know like we might be seen as like oh well we, we're good parents because oh those parents aren't doing that it's not about comparing yeah. ourselves to other parents it's like the way we know how is like if we actually communicate with our child mm. And so these are the things that we're putting in place. And I feel that um, child and parent kind of connection is so freaking crucial for yeah. for just life in itself, right? And so, sorry, just to, for you to carry on. It's not, so you were in a space where, you know, love for you was a little bit fucked up and love for yeah. you in a physical sense was pr- pretty much like a um, permission slip, like, hey, me and you are together yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm. there was... Um yeah, that's all. That was all I fucking knew. Um, yeah, and it it wasn't until you know, and this might sound out of it, and I, you know, I couldn't give a fuck what it sounds like. But even though I had had my children, I didn't really know what love was until my son passed away. Wow, you know. And then it was like I was shot in my fucking heart Mm. because it was so fucking painful. And I think what happens is when you become a parent and that, it's, it's, um, I don't know, you, it's there, you know it's there, you know these are the fucking, you know, I don't want to say fruits of your labour, you know. (laughs) But these are your your absolute world. Yeah. 
Um, but I I don't know how to explain that, but I'm I'm just gonna say I I didn't know what absolute true fucking love was. I that's what I was gonna say. It, it's just like autopilot. Mm. You know, you do what you need to do. You know, you love them. You tell you, yeah. you tell them you love them every fucking day. But I didn't know what absolute fucking love was until until my son passed away and. Um, you know, and then obviously I went on my hikoi for those years. And then when I started my new journey, because my heart was fucking broken for my son, I knew the only ones that were able to repair that heart were my remaining children. Mm, wow. You know? Um, and so coming out of that... I now have a a total different outlook on love. Beautiful. And and that was from my experiences that uh, showed me what the fuck love is. Mm. You know, oh boy, is it far from just words that bind you together. Oh my goodness gracious. (laughs) I don't even fucking say those words. Unless I absolutely fucking mean it, mm. you know. Um, yeah, yeah. No. That's such a big topic, eh? Yeah. Just like love, and I feel it's still you're still trying to form the words that can describe, yeah. you know, what their feeling is for you. And I, for me, I think that's that's what love is: is when you have this feeling that you can't describe. You know, you're trying to find the words to it. And when I think about, you know, the emotion of love, you know, you know what happiness is, Mm. right? You know Mm. what joy is. You know what gratitude is. You know what, like, anger is. You know what frustration is. But then you get this emotion just brewing in you, but you don't have the word for it. I get that when I look at my daughter, to be honest. Like, you know, all my kids, but fuck, I look at my daughter. She's my only daughter. Hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, she'd just be fucking sitting there doing fuck all. Mm. And, but then she'll turn around and she'll smile and I'm just like, oh, fuck it. Um, I, I can't explain it. Mm. Cause I'm like, fuck, that is, um, you know, I, I love all my kids, but my daughter, that is my flesh. That is mm. my fucking. You know, oh, I can't explain it. I, I, That's what I would honestly say. the The sense of pure love is mm. is is that. And and the next thing to that is, I'll ask you, like, you know, can you describe the feeling of having a baby? You know, you can't describe that feeling either. Mm. You know, it's totally different feelings, but you still can't describe it. But I'd say, hey, that's that's an act of love. Yeah. You know, so you're sort of like re-experiencing this emotion in different ways mm. and the thing that i want to echo to um next is like when you think about your mama and you think about the mama that she has and all of these things that's coming up um man you have the capacity to do the healing eh? Mm. like for her she doesn't necessarily have to open up all of these cans of no. worms you know but you have it in you to be able to be like cool i got this mum, mm. and i know that for sure because it's happened in my journey there's been things that, that have unfolded like with me and my papa and man, I know what my old man's been through. He's been through so much, bro. Mm. So much loss. Um, losing children, you know, going um living away and then coming home like just heaps of um things that have happened for Papa. Um, the way that he was treated and so when I've had altercations with him that have left me with a little bit of mummy um, not knowing it at the time, but as I sort of grew my awareness, I was like, nah, man, I got this, mm. you know, because my relationship with Papa's mean, like it's good. And I don't need it to sort of, I don't need him to, to explain things because I have a better understanding of things yeah. now. And I'm keen to take on that responsibility because it can stop with me. Yeah. And I feel people can grow that. Other people need that sense of validation or that sense of um, conversation with mm. with people. Um, but I feel where you're at, I think there is that time where it's sort of like, nah, I got this, mum. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, I and she's already that. proud of you. It's like yeah. her, she's giving you that blessing. It's sort of like her getting that sense of relief mm. that you've learned, you know, from I, how I, she was. I can feel like she might still hold a bit of guilt and things like yeah. that because – because she didn't know how to love me or she didn't know how to, you know. And, and when we had that korero, I was like, oh, mum, fuck, man, you're bomb. Like, mm. we've, you created this fucking mean family of a daughter, two sons. You know, you've got grandchildren and you're our fucking queen. Yeah. You know, like, I know, you know, even though she went through that abuse with her fucking... You know, adoptive parents and that. And I told her, I don't want absolutely fucking nothing to do with them Mm. because of what they put you through. She's forgiven them and things like that because she said she needed to forgive them. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, well, I don't. (laughs) (laughs) I don't. Um, Because at the end of the day, you know, I didn't have them in my life, so it ain't no fucking loss to me. Mm. My main focus is that you're all goods. Because now I'm I'm at the age of and the headstrong woman that I fucking am now, I know I'm fucking with you anymore. Mm. You know, and I just and and what's awesome is that her she's been writing to her birth mother. Wow. Who lives in Hastings. Wow. And she's never met her or nothing. And so that's a, that's a, you know, I'm really fucking excited for my mum because she just moved home after 15 years in Australia only a couple of weeks ago. So she's going to settle down and things like that and she's going to embark on that journey Beautiful. of going and meeting her birth mother. And I'm like, holy fuck, mum, I'm living for this. Ah. Like, because, you know, like just going back to that, she had a lot of questions. She probably had a lot of questions as to why am mm. I here being abused? Rah, 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 rah. Mm-hmm. You know, and and anyway, she's she's embarking on a journey, on her journey to of get, closure. get her questions answered. Ah. And I feel like I've I've had my questions answered. Mm. You know, I I now realise that throughout my years of my childhood and that. What I was doing was expecting and wanting oranges from a fucking apple tree, <laughs> you know. And um, it's uh, yeah. So I feel like I've ticked all my boxes. Me. I've I've got all my answers, and now it's Mum's turn to go and do that for her. And now you have the and capacity now I can to support, support her. her in that. That's yeah. awesome. And honestly, next we've been like having some beautiful quarter, and I have one last question for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are two things, significant moments in our life, right? The first one is the moment that we're born. Mm. And the second moment is when we understand why. Mm. Do you have a reason why you believe you were born? Hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, eh? Um, well, I was born, no, nah, yeah. It's... Um, to fucking bring my children into this world mm-hmm. because they came to my womb because, you know, that was their fucking, that was their destiny. And if I wasn't here, that wouldn't have fucking happened. Mm-hmm. Because honestly, I know I do heaps of fucking things, you know, I try to um, utilize my platform to raise awareness around this. I try to do kaupapa to fucking encourage, inspire and things like that. But my main fucking thing why I'm on this planet are those kids. <laughs> you know, that's that's why I was, yeah, you, you know, a, a significant day is the day you're born. Well, I was reborn three years ago. You know, and and I was reborn for those fucking kids. Mm. So, y- yes, I do a lot of things here, there, and everywhere, and things like that. But that that they, they are my fucking purpose. Wow, oh, that is powerful. And just thank you again for mm. just coming on, uh, sharing your kōrero and uh, to your hoa. Thank you for coming and holding that space as well. And uh, to the rest of the whānau, uh thank you for tuning in. And no doubt there's going to be more kōrero and mm. the Sister Nix is going to be bringing out a podcast at some point. Um, and again, uh, just again, if there has been any kōrero that has come up um, and that 
you feel you sort of like want to share or reach out, uh, feel free to reach out to me or leave comments or anything like that. Uh, furthermore, um, just want to say thank you to everyone mm-hmm. and thanks against us. Kia ora. Yummy. <laughs> <laughs>